Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio. We have a different type of show this week. We have a guy here in the office who's been here 30 plus years, Rob. And Miles is with us today. And we're going to talk about some values that we think are readily available in the precious metals market. So we're going to start with gold and silver quickly, and then we'll move on to the ideas that we think are values in the investment world today. Sure. Well, we saw those breaks down in pretty much all the metals except palladium. And we've been covering that for the last couple of weeks as it's broken down. And here over the last week, we've had a little bit of a reversal back up, but nothing that says we've turned around. So with the election coming up and on the heels of the first, let's say, a one of a kind presidential debate last night, it wouldn't be surprising to see things continue to flatline or maybe even inch down. The Dow is doing the same. So we felt this actually would be a really good week to answer some more specific questions because we talk a lot about the geopolitical broad strokes. We talk a lot about how the prices compare to other markets and how the prices compare to each other. And that's one thing that we find ourselves getting a lot of questions on is what are the specifics about how some of these metals relate to each other? And then how even within a single metal, like say rare coin versus gold coin. And whenever we see a big opportunity presenting itself in the market repeatedly every five, six, seven years, bringing somebody like Robin, who's been doing this for a while, certainly <laughs> certainly one of the guys that helped train both Robert and I as we came in. And Rob, nowhere near your first time on the show either. So I know we wanted to talk a little bit just your history, both in the rare coin market and what you think you're seeing there as where the opportunities are. And then something that has just been inching off of a lot of our listeners' tongues, what's going on with the platinum market and why do we keep trying to shove it into the conversation every week? Well, I'll jump in here before we get to that and just preface this by saying, you know, we do this every day, each one of us, everybody. We compare things. We we look at buying one thing versus another, whether it's going to launch one place or another place. If you're making a bigger purchase with a car or a truck, you've got options. And why you'd make those decisions on one thing versus another, there can be a multitude of factors there. And we're gonna talk about the factors of why we do one metal or one coin versus another metal and another coin at a specific time. It's not that we just prefer one thing or another. We're actually looking for value within the niche market of the precious metals market. Correct. And when I first started, I had a client call me and said, I want to buy, it was like $50,000 worth of silver because I think silver is going to be worth the same as gold one day. And I just started laughing. <laughs> and he goes, young man, I don't think you know what you're doing. I was like, well, I think I do. I started buying gold and silver when I was a kid back in 1973. He goes, well, why don't you like silver? I'm like, I like silver just fine. But she's like a blonde in a convertible looking for a good time. And gold's more like the woman down at church that I want to marry. And one of the other brokers stood over the cubicle and looked down at me and said, where'd you come up with that, McLaughlin? And I said, I just made it up. Wayne, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I have always been a gold guy. And to me, everything compares back to gold. When I look at the price of platinum versus gold right now, it is amazing. If we look at a short history of platinum, we had an eight year period from 2000 to 2008 where platinum consistently was worth twice the price of gold. Then we had another seven year period from 2008 to 2015 where gold and platinum traded within $100 of each other. One was up, the other was down and then it would change and it went back and forth like that for seven years. Then you had Dieselgate hit in 2015 and the demand for platinum suddenly began to crater. Gold never looked back. Platinum continued to fall. Right now it takes two ounces of platinum and has consistently for the last few years versus an ounce of gold. So I look at platinum, I see the demand shifting I see the supply changing. They switched from palladium to platinum, and we talked about this last year, because palladium was a quarter to a third of the price of platinum. Well, now palladium is two and a half times the price of platinum. Automakers are seeing auto sales around the world down 28% for gasoline automobiles. 
At the same time, emission standards are increasing in China and elsewhere, and the demand for platinum is continuing to grow because they can now substitute platinum for palladium without affecting the emission standards. This just happened, and the automakers are doing it. Now, they are not going to tell you that. No, they're not. No. It's proprietary and confidential, according to their press spokesman. However, the manufacturers of the catalytic converters are already admitting, yeah, we're doing it. And even a 5% allocation to platinum from palladium is close to 15,000 ounces of palladium just this year alone. So we can already see the demand side changing. And then you have the supply side. You have 80% of the world's palladium comes from Russia and South Africa, and there are supply issues. They cannot produce palladium at the current rate. They may not be able to produce platinum at the current rate either, but there is a supply of platinum. It is being absorbed. It is a great time. We have the data. People should call their ICA broker and let us walk them through that. Yeah, so you covered a lot there, and and let's jump back so that we can talk about it here on the chart, since that's what we do here. We throw a little technicals and less Tories around. We'll talk fundamentals, but here we are where you started, I think, in around 2006. Platinum divided by gold. Platinum was two times the price of gold, roughly. We'll see that on the chart. And that continued all the way up until 2008-ish, late 2008. And it actually started back in late 2000. That two-to-one ratio was an eight-year stretch for the most part. That's a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was the norm. Yes. Was platinum was two times the price of gold. And then, as you talked about, we'll see it on the chart here, that ratio came down and came back down to around one-to-one, bounced plus or minus or just a, a bit above one for a while. And then Dieselgate, so that people understand, that's the Volkswagen scandal where they were faking emissions tests or something like that? Well, they did it in a laboratory, and yet it didn't translate to their the real production vehicles. Yeah. In their vehicle. So that's what he referred to as dieselgate. And then we jump to the platinum-palladium ratio, which is what the auto manufacturers are going to look at in terms of using one of those two metals fairly interchangeably for the production of catalytic converters in cars. So... One of the things that I think, Rob, you pointed out to me uh, a few weeks ago when we were talking about this was the amount of time that platinum and palladium would have such a disparity in price, meaning the distance in price makes it so that a boardroom of auto manufacturer boardroom, they would look at the production cost, look at the material cost, and they would say, well, that one's been down there for long enough. And the, what we identified was about 18 months of time that would elapse for that price to have the distance between two to one or so. And 18 months elapses, they'd make changes, they retool, and they start to buy the other metal. I actually think you can see some of this in the ratio chart. We'll post this chart, platinum palladium ratio, here in the last few months, you've seen some bounces and maybe even created a double bottom. And we'll look at it closely and we'll follow it going forward. But there's a lot to be said with the amount of time that palladium now has been way above the price of platinum, making platinum the value. So relative to its sister metal palladium, platinum's the value. Relative to gold, platinum's the value. So you might have heard out there in the industry that silver's gold on steroids. Well, Rob's arguing that platinum is gold on steroids. Very definitely. So, and I think it's good to also bring up the supply line discussion because you are talking about basically two countries controlling the entire platinum group metal supply Well, palladium, worldwide. palladium specifically. Palladium Plat- specifically, yeah, but plat- rhodium and iridium and rhodium, some of the other platinum yeah. byproducts. Right, and 70% of the world's platinum comes from South Africa, at least 70 to 80%. So they may have their own problems there as well because those mines are old and deep and the expertise it takes to run them sometimes is not there. 
So you've got potential increase in demand from existing automotive manufacturers because eventually you hit a price where it's cost effective for them to swap all their production equipment back over to use platinum instead of palladium. Correct. So that's one thing. The second thing is the concern over potential supply lines coming out of Russia and South Africa. And then you have a third thing because you have tightening emission standards in countries like China. Oh, yeah. While they're increasing as they become slightly more capitalistic, at least in their business dealings, you're seeing a lot of increased middle class and therefore a lot more buying of vehicles. Right. And tighter emission standards. So right. They tighter, have to yeah. No more coal material. burning cars. Darn it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and you also mentioned the new kind of fad. Well, I wouldn't even call oh, it. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. The new diesel hybrids diesel hybrids in europe are becoming popular very Britain, popular because you get the gas mileage europe. i mean i have a couple of hybrid priuses myself i love them i would love to have a diesel prius i mean that would change my world from 50 plus miles to a gallon to probably 80 plus miles to a gallon if i could get a diesel hybrid yeah the demand in england is up 200 percent even as automobile sales are crashing around the world at 28 percent negative year on year diesel hybrid cars in england are up 220 percent and in countries like spain and germany diesel hybrids are up 50 percent year on year so there's a difference in trend in the auto demand well and if you want to throw a little icing on the platinum cake one of my favorite things i'm looking at over the next 20 years is the increase in biotech and nanotech Right. Using anti-neoplastic metals, of which platinum, platinum is the primary usage. Yes, and medical demand for platinum has been increasing significantly right. over the last five years because of that. And one thing, I need to go back to the diesel hybrids. Platinum is used in diesel motors. Palladium has been used in automobile gasoline motors primarily. So that's why the diesel hybrid is such a significant factor in increasing platinum demand. But yes, medical demand is something for platinum that is growing year on year for the last seven, eight years. Plus, I think all it would take would be Elon Musk saying the word platinum and it would go to the moon. <laughs> right, they're going to make a, make a platinum spaceship. <laughs> so... There you have it. For those of you that have been asking, hey, other than just showing some lines on a piece of paper on the show every week, here's some of the more narrowed down fundamentals specifically about the platinum group metals, platinum and palladium and their long term relationship to gold. Now, speaking of gold, gold, based on that conversation, you should take 100 percent of your assets and just buy platinum, right? No, I <laughs> limit the allocation of my client's portfolio between 10 to 20 percent depending upon their risk tolerance, because it is a speculative metal. And I get that 40% of its demand is auto sector demand, whether it's catalytic converters, spark plugs, or fuel cells. You have 20 to 25% demand in industry like medical. You have demand of about 25 to 30% for jewelry, and then somewhere in the 10 to 15% investment. This time a year ago, investment demand for platinum was almost zero. So it's starting to change. So that's the breakdown of platinum. But getting back to gold, I do look at gold as being the standard that everything else is compared to, whether it's your dollar or your silver or your platinum or the collectible coin market. We have seen a collapse also in prices on collectible coins, primarily the U.S. coin market, which, as you guys know, I studiously avoided American collectible coins up until a couple of years ago. I was primarily interested in fractional European coins from England, France, Germany, Scandinavian countries, because our clients, and still can, by the way, today, buy fractional European coins for four or five or six percent more than they would pay for a fractional bullion eagle like a tenth ounce or a quarter ounce coin. Right, but explain the difference. Well, the coins that we're talking about were not made yesterday. Right. We're talking about the coins that were minted prior to the confiscation, the global confiscation of 1933, 
whereas 10% on average of the coins that were minted 90 to 120 years ago never made it into circulation. Those are now rare coins. So you say you weren't doing old U.S. coins five, 10 years ago. Why not? Well, the premiums were too high. Yep. I mean, I could protect my client's privacy and their ownership for a fraction of the premium in the old European collectible coins and still can today. Well, those are good values, too. They're great values. Yep. I mean, you can buy collectible, uncirculated European coins for 5 to 8% above the price of a modern-day bullion coin and be private and protected from seizure. But now, looking at the American coin market, two years ago, that market began collapsing, and it hit the all-time low at the beginning of this year. Never before. I mean, like, take the $10 Indian, for instance. Gorgeous coin. MS-63. When we go back to June of 2006 with gold, a half-ounce gold eagle was a $350 coin. The 10 Indian was a $1,700 coin. Hmm. That's different. Yeah, it was a 500% premium. So that's why you weren't interested in paying whatever that time multiple of gold is. No, I'm not interested at all. But at and, these prices today... Yeah, because they've fallen from 500%, you know, in 2006. They went to 350% premium a couple years later, 200% premium, 150% premium. Those premiums continued to fall. Now you can buy that same coin for $1,375, which is a 30% premium above a half-ounce gold eagle. I look at that and go, okay, I don't mind paying a premium for something. I just want it to be worth it. Well, it yeah. depends on what that premium's relative to, right? 30% right? into something that could move, even if, let's say it doesn't go back to 500, let's say it right. just goes back to twice the price of gold. Right. You still captured a 70% premium for free. Right. And for your clients, and the reason we like these strategies and we bring someone like Rob in from time to time is because what you guys were doing in the 80s and 90s, you were able to pull some of your clients out of those coins at four and 500% premiums and go into, let's tie this all back together, Palladium in 2006 for 300 bucks an ounce. If you were that smart, yes, you could have. Or do you have just swapped into British sovereigns? Yeah, to and just maintain the gold position, but yeah, in a cheaper I had clients product. that were doing that. Back in 2000, I was coming out of American coins, especially circulated American coins, going into uncirculated European coins, and we were gaining 30-plus percent more ounces. We've done this a number of times. I don't think any of us are in love with any particular product. I think that we are constantly looking at ways that we can increase the ounces in our clients' portfolios. That's the bottom line. Right. Absolutely. I'm not in love with the 10 Indian. I'm in love with it. I think it's a gorgeous coin. But I'm looking at the premiums where they are today and tell my clients, look, in five years or seven or eight, nine years, we need to talk about taking advantage of where those premiums are going and get back into more ounces of gold, maybe more European collectibles, exiting the American market and going back to the European market like I've done before. Right. You're loving the project you're building over time, not the actual tools you're using to do it. Right. And the same is true with platinum. We'll be exiting the platinum market. If we can just get back to gold, that would be amazing. With the platinum price, back to one to one with gold. Yeah. Will it go back to two to one? Probably, but I'm going to begin feathering out of my $10 Indians and my platinum ounces as we get back to par with where they have been before. Well, it's basically value investing in your own smaller market niche. You're looking for the good value based on what it's done in the past relative to the gold price, looking for the value. Now's the time to buy them. That's why we have been buying them. Right. And it's not like day trading. This is like sitting on your front porch watching the grass grow. We're talking about trades that may happen once every five or ten years, maybe longer. So it's not like we can go in today and then out tomorrow. 
No, but you're also not looking for day trading returns of fractions of a percent. Correct. You're investing where you have a knowledge advantage as well as a price advantage. And then you're waiting for the next advantage to present itself. Correct. So I think the point is, if you are going to be buying physical gold, I would be selective like you are with even going to lunch at one place versus another. I would be selective about what you want to buy. Have some strategy with it. There are values beyond what we just talked about today. It's what we've been doing as a company for 48 years. So we encourage you to give us a call because there are values in this market that you're probably not even aware of. We can talk to you about that. We can give you some suggestions and we can explain why. So thanks for joining us again this week. I hope you enjoyed this slightly different show, more like a water cooler discussion around our office and the types of things that we're always talking about in the metals market. So if you'd like to speak with one of us individually, give us a call. As Robert said, any of our advisors would love to talk with you about your personal portfolio. We can be reached at 1-800-525-9556. If you liked what you heard, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell. You can find more info on our website, McElvaney.com, at Twitter, ICA Gold, or on Facebook, McElvaney Financial. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.